Hello, I'm Dr. Jan Gormievski, an architect and neuroscientist from the Good Environments Architecture Group, and more specifically from Psychological Design, a subgroup of us who choose to focus on architectural design for better health and well-being. Several years ago, while I was doing my PhD on the impact of architecture on the brain and psychiatric health generally, I came across a really useful model to bring the abstractions of perceptual and positive psychology into the literally concrete reality of architecture. That model is called salutogenic theory. Salutogenic theory was originally conceived and developed by a medical sociologist called Aaron Antonovsky throughout the 1970s, 1980s and until his death in the 1990s. The theory was inspired by a number of amazing scholars, among them Viktor Frankl, a Jewish neurologist and psychologist who managed to survive several Nazi death camps during World War II. During this horrific period, Frankl noticed how he and a minority of others around him somehow survived against all odds. Extremely poor sanitation, bitter winters without clothing and heating, terrible diseases, starvation, malnutrition, sleeplessness, overwork, and, of course, emotional upheaval. The thing that made life possible, according to Frankel, was exactly what made life worth living. A blind sense of hope in the face of despair. A constant renewal of the sense of meaning. Individuals who somehow maintained their sense of meaningfulness intact could somehow swim against the current, and if not thrive, at least they didn't perish. Antonovsky explored this tantalising idea to see if this resistance could be harnessed for both public health and for individuals. He wanted to know if this effect could be employed upstream before an identifiable pathology or reason for demise ever takes hold. The model is often characterised as a river with a waterfall at one end. The waterfall represents death and a person's proximity to it determines the best strategy to ensure they're getting the most appropriate care. In this model, most of the effort comes far too late, once chances of success have thinned and the costs of recovery have escalated. Academics researching salutogenics have discovered that there are real benefits in upstream interventions, and that these don't only affect health, but cognition, general ability and social function also. They've also discovered that it's never too late because these approaches are very protective and continue to yield benefits even once death is in sight. This makes salutogenic approaches really useful in the care of people in chronic, palliative or dementia care. Salutogenics has been very well tested and validated over thousands of studies sometimes in huge cross-sectional groups. It's been found to be roughly as effective around the world and in vastly different cultures, across age groups and other demographic indicators, among healthy people and those with disabilities, mental illnesses, chronic and acute illnesses, injuries and dementia. It's been used in nursing, public health, healthcare, architectural design, the design of models of care in education, in prisons, in workplaces, in rehabilitation and in community groups. But let's go back to what salutogenic theory is, so we can develop ideas about how we can use it in the care of people with dementia. Put most simply, salutogenics is a model for understanding psychological impacts on health and well-being. It's not the only model, and it's not even a perfect model, but it is robust and easy enough to apply in diverse circumstances to improve the health and well-being of just about any group of people using any number of approaches, from the physical spaces that I design through to intangibles like laws and rules, through to even more abstract things like models of care and ways of going about interpersonal communications. Essentially, the model goes something like this. Life is entropic. The inevitability of death at one end places a burden on life. 
There are forces that force us backwards like a great headwind. These forces are called generalized resistance deficits, or GRDs. They are the pull of disease, despair, and even death. These forces are ubiquitous and redouble as they take hold, but to counter them there are opposite forces, the generalized resistance resources, GRRs. These forces keep you buoyant, healthy and positive. So life is like a tug of war between these two opposites, with the abstract notions of death at one end and total engagement with life at the other. The little floating boy, buoy as Americans call them, is what's called the sense of coherence, or SOC, the state of relative well-being in suspension between these two opposing positive and negative forces. It's sometimes useful to break down the generalised resistance deficits, they're the bad guys, into individual problems if there's any chance of fixing them. If I've got a cut, I want a bandage. But it's mostly just the headwind of stuff. It's the bills we have to pay, the sleepless nights and minor illnesses that will come and go. But for the elderly, the GRDs seem more permanent. Loss of perceptual and physical ability, pain, losing friends, feeling abandoned by family, forgetting things. And far from the bliss that we see in the Golden Age travel ads, retirement can mean a huge severance of a sense of meaning. Generalised resistance resources aren't quite so specific. They give people mojo to keep going. To support the GRRs, you can provide for the lowest order needs, a bandage for that cut that I just mentioned. This kind of resource is called a manageability resource. Others include food when you're hungry, a bed for when you're tired, or a roof to keep out the weather, and perhaps a dialysis machine for when your kidneys have packed up. There's no doubt that manageability resources are very important, but they don't put the wind in your sails. They do little to propel you toward a full and wonderful sense of total engagement in life. What's far more important are the resources they call comprehensibility resources, things that support your ability to achieve your goals and skillfully navigate life's pitfalls, knowledge, power, strength and general ability. More important still are the resources that keep life rich, fun, love-filled and meaningful because it's these things that keep people bothering to battle adversity, to get out of bed in the morning. These generalised resistance resources are categorised as meaningfulness resources. What's extraordinary is just how little manageability is needed if a sense of meaningfulness is strong. Let's go back to Frankel's observation in Terezin and Auschwitz, or else to those who have a rich spiritual life. Of all the generalised resistance resources, meaningfulness matters most. The more positive people are, the better their ability to survive hardship. I've got an amazing photo of an Indian religious man who is lying back calmly, happy as can be, with all of his possessions in a roll by his side. But he's on a bed of sharpened nails. This guy has no shelter. He has nothing. Most likely has very little food. But what he does have is the peace that he finds in his spiritual life. We are in the habit of understanding mental disability as a deficit, as something less. But on rare occasions we find just the opposite. I know we're talking about dementia here, and the following example is not from a person with dementia cohort. But nevertheless, there is a lesson that is instructive. There are several studies that report people with severe psychosis who consistently outperform healthy controls. In these studies, healthy people underestimate their own judgment or abilities. In one of these studies, Shergill, Samson, Bayes, Frith and Wolpert, 2005, observed how schizophrenic patients outperformed controls when they had to assess and reciprocate the force that they felt on a lever. In this study, 
all the subjects underestimated their own efforts, but schizophrenic patients underestimated those efforts by only 27.5%, whereas controls underestimated them by 43.5%. This underestimation of one's own force, one's own impact on the world, appears to be a factor in mental health. The difference of nearly 63% is indeed significant. In this and the other experiments, scientists expected to find the opposite and were flummoxed by the results. But I assert that this is a measure of the healthy margin of blind positivity that we all need to survive life's normal pressures. So let's pause to look at our problem, the problem of old age and decline. What we want to see is a high quality life right up to the very end, and ideally up to a right old age. So on this x-axis we can measure quality of life, and on the y, time. Now what usually happens is that throughout people's lives their sense of coherence improves. They get more experience, that's comprehensibility, People's lives are often enriched with greater meaning because older people typically have more developed spiritual lives. Sometimes retirement is replaced with volunteering, meaning that the sense that people are doing something meaningful with their lives can sometimes be even more profound once they retire. But then something happens. A broken hip, the death of a spouse, an acute illness. Life events like these often signal the end because they severely set back the sense of coherence. Not long ago, death followed pretty quickly, but with improved medicine and greater wealth, life events are no longer the death sentence that they once were, and instead they often mark a long and slow decline. A common pattern is that the quality of life deteriorates in steps following life events until life simply isn't worth living. A more desirable way to go is in your footsteps, to fall off your tree, like most of us used to, just way later, after a much longer and more fulfilling life. We can do little to stop the negative effects of the life events, and possibly we can't even avoid them. But what we can do is support recovery and life between these events using the salutogenic paradigm. So now we know what salutogenesis is, but how do we use this knowledge to design buildings, to conceive models of care, to look after people who are old and have severe cognitive impairment? We have to look at generalised resistance resources to see how meaningfulness, comprehensibility and manageability can be optimised and even maximised using a broad range of approaches and given the particular difficulties around dementia. Let's look at meaningfulness first, because it's the zest of life that's so palpably diminished in most dementia patients. Meaningfulness is best characterised as the meaningful connection with others and the world around us. Meaningful connections are often indisputably to real things and real people, that is, family, friends, pets, etc., but meaningful connections can also be to abstractions, notions of God or planetary health, to the spirits of ancestors, to causes or political movements, for example. Full engagement in life is when a person makes these outward concerns really precious. As an architect, it's difficult to directly provide for these needs because they're as diverse as people are. And unless you're designing churches, architects seldom get a chance to provide for singular ways of seeing. And I'm not sure it's the same for nursing home managers and their staff. It's really tough designing one-size-fits-all models of care for genuinely diverse needs. But here's a tip. The most important step is finding and removing meaninglessness. Institutions of all kinds are all too often replete with meaninglessness. This happens whenever the system, or the needs of the institution, or indeed the needs of the carer, override the needs of the individual, the cared for. To help with this, the buildings I design are literally person-centred, 
and are filled with good things to do, and any negatives have to be removed. At this point, I want to get away from pure sewage eugenics and look at the brain. People lose the function of their frontal lobes as a response to negative circumstances. Over a longer period, this causes atrophy, which may be causal for some forms of dementia. When the frontal cortex is deficient, there is a far greater reliance on the striatum to determine action. This part of the brain is triggered by perceptions, so the presence of an object solicits a response rather than a deliberative need. For this reason, things that are on view have to encourage positive choices, and anything that should be discouraged just has to be hidden. The affordance of an exit door should be hidden, because when people have advanced Alzheimer's or frontotemporal dementia, they generally don't mean to escape as such. They just act on the trigger offered by the exit. Trying to stop people, however, will be taken badly because stopping anyone doing anything that they want to do is a kind of negative event, and that will only exacerbate symptoms and make people feel powerless and like their lives are meaningless. Likewise, models of care should be person-centred. This involves simple things like making sure clients feel they're valued and always have something to give. People with dementia should be treated compassionately and as individuals and therefore should be allowed to have individualised programs, diets and treatment. Well-considered handovers, choices of things to do, staff routines and pain management should all be considered so that they don't interfere with people's desires and personal habits. But person-centred care is only just a start. We can foster meaning through ecological approaches also. We know that for just about everyone, and people with dementia absolutely no less, other people are really important, and we can encourage visitors through skillful design and through good programming. Even putting in playgrounds for kids is a start, but we can go further still. Dragset et al. 2014, discovered that reassurance of a person's worthiness predicates a strong sense of coherence and possibly even recovery. And this can be improved by opportunities to contribute meaningfully. Elderly people want visitors, but they don't want to suck up the valuable time of their visiting kids and friends. So we can design opportunities for them to give. The Masonic Basin View Aged Care Facility near Nara put in a hydroponic garden. This garden produces fresh fish and vegetables which clients can harvest and give to visitors, thereby allowing clients to feel that they too have something tangible to give their visitors. We all know people with dementia. My grandmother had it at the very end of her life, and I think that one of her stories is illustrative of this point. Even when her short-term memory was going, to assure my own grandmother that she had lots of visitors, and indeed she did, we put a visitor's book by her bed. My grandmother made a habit of checking the book regularly and making her own marks and comments by her visitors' names. The book had another real benefit. Just its presence alone put pressure on friends and family to actually come so that their names would be regularly counted. Comprehensibility is another real challenge for people with dementia. The difficulty people have with accessing memory and trying to do things is profound. But being given choices about what to do and when to do those things is still possible and very empowering. Many care homes now provide mock kitchens, sheds and chicken coops, but the real thing is better. If patients can be given a carrot to peel while the meals are being cooked, or if they can collect the eggs of real chickens, then they can feel that they're still being effective. Likewise, when people become frail, it's sometimes easier to do things for them, even when they still have some capacity themselves. When it comes to manageability, it's not good to overburden clients. 
but to keep the self-management skills going as long as possible. In other words, personal hygiene isn't just about being clean, and eating isn't just about being fed. The acts involved in doing these things are every bit as important. The number of things that we can do to enhance people's lives is infinite, but we do sometimes get stuck, often simply because we don't have sufficient insight into people's condition, into their headspace, into their needs and their desires. As I said earlier, salutogenics is a model, and only a model, but it's a very powerful one because it gives us an easy way to identify what interventions will help and why.